All right, so we are live here with a former law enforcement officer and now a doctor, um, Dr. Trevor Wilkins, who is an EMDR and trauma therapist, um, who, as we will dig into today because of his own personal story, um, uh, moved from being a law enforcement officer into a trauma and EMDR therapist. So we're going to dig into what the heck EMDR is, because I know that I am a big, big believer in it. I know it's what like Navy SEALs, when they use, when they come back from deployment um, to help desensitize to traumas. Um, I know. So it's, it's, really, really important for you guys to, I guess, learn about this and understand what you need to know specific to first responders. So Trevor, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank um, you for having me. I always enjoy talking to, uh, to my people, you know, public safety people. You know what? I say that too. I'm like, I, I don't consider myself a civilian. My husband is a police officer. Um, but I'm so in this world, like every single day, it's, I, I'm way more comfortable talking to, to you guys, to the first responders and stuff than I am to civilians. I struggle on the street because I'm like, you guys really don't understand what the world is like, what's mm -hmm. really going out there. Right. You don't understand what, they, what these responders are protecting you from um, and shielding you from. So yeah, this is totally my world as well. So Trevor, why don't we get into first a little bit about your story so people can learn about you. So you were a law enforcement officer. Can you tell us a little bit about your career and what caused your pivot? Because I know you've got a story there um, yeah. to get into what you're doing now. Sure. Yeah. So I served uh, 15 years in uniform law enforcement, a uh, small, small agency, about a 11 man department, uh, then went to uh, you know, what I call a, a big town, small city, uh, about 600 officers. And then eventually uh, through uh, a state traffic uh, type of agency ended up with uh, state police here in Kentucky. So uh, they had a merger after I had uh, joined the traffic side of it all, the, the vehicle enforcement side. So um, th that was my, you know, that, that was my 15 years. I, I was a road dog. I was never out of uniform except for a, a short amount of time. Uh, that's what I really enjoyed. Had a lot of loves, uh, things like criminal interdiction on the highway. That's what led me to the, to the the vehicle enforcement side and, and the traffic side. So, um, about uh, eight or nine years into that, I had responded to a fatal accident. And you know, being a be a traffic guy, I've been to a billion fatal accidents. And you always hate it for the family, and you always hate it for the victims and and the people that have to see that. But just part of the job, and, and I knew that. So. I had responded uh, kind of benignly at first to just another bad traffic accident. And, and long story short, it turned out that this lady had, had struck the side of a dump truck, had gone through a guardrail uh, down a long uh, embankment and struck a tree. Uh, unbeknownst to us, when she struck the tree, uh, her legs were pinned in uh, underneath the, the front of the dash and underneath the steering wheel. And unfortunately, because of the severity of the impact, her vehicle caught on fire. So I uh, won't go to, you know, uh, terrible detail, but we certainly uh, saw her demise in that terrible situation. So, so you know, uh, uh, certainly a, a difficult thing, but, uh, you know, probably top three terrible things I had to see. And I think anybody would put that kind of high in the list of difficult things to deal with in law enforcement, but just another wreck. Uh, that, that's what I felt. It's just another wreck. Uh, a tough one, but I went home that night and I took off my uniform and I put it back on the next day and went to work. And uh, the reason I bring that up is, is because, you know, we're taught for so long in these uh, mental health, um, mental health uh, conferences or, or mental health trying to better law enforcement that, that the change is supposed to happen overnight. Well, it didn't for me. Uh, I went right back to work. What I started to notice, though, about a period of two years is I had gone from, you know, very hardworking, uh, go to, I hope, uh, law enforcement officer that was always willing to get stuff done, you know, had awards for, for most felonies in the area, most felony arrests, and really enjoyed my job. Hoped that I was the guy that you could call and, and I would take on any mission. I went from that guy to the absolute worst employee you could ever want. I was written up regularly, got numerous complaints, started becoming uh, pretty verbally and physically aggressive in times that may not have been necessary. Nothing illegal or immoral and ethical or anything to that extent, but definitely not doing myself any favors. Uh, eventually, it got to the point where a uh, supervisor knew that my numbers had dropped, that I was struggling. Uh, he didn't know what, 
And, and, and to be honest, I didn't know what, and he had me uh, take a few days off. Uh, in the midst of that, uh, looking back now, um, you know, again, not just at work, but I'd become very um, hypervigilant. I'd become very angry all the time. My alcohol use had started to increase uh, to a point where it, where it was starting to affect uh, my family and I. Uh, my family was stressed out. My job was stressed out. And uh, so I took those days off, thought eh, maybe a good idea. I'm not one that usually takes days off. And uh, like a, a lot of agencies in the world or a lot of uh, employers in the world, after about three days, you got to have a doctor's note to come back. Well, seven months later, after I had sought help, uh, two medical doctors, a psychiatrist and two psychologists said, absolutely no way will we sign a paper for you to go back. And that became after a series of me finally reaching out for help, kind of realizing that everything was falling apart underneath me. And um, there was really nobody in the area that, that understood public safety. I went to a couple of therapists, um, even though I didn't really want to. I uh, went to a couple of therapists that had been recommended to me, people that some psych local psychologists knew. And uh, the first lady was really nice, but she cried when I told that story about the wreck. So it wasn't, I became the caretaker in that room. Uh, the next gentleman I saw, a uh, great therapist, I, I know him today, but he said, you know, uh, Trevor, your anger and your PTSD are so bad. I don't know what to do with you and I don't know where to send you. So uh, here I am finally uh, re reaching out for help, everything feeling like it was falling apart. And it seemed like nobody could help. So um, that, that was kind of my journey out of public safety. Eventually, I burned seven months worth of sick time that I had saved up. And then I had to leave. Uh, there, there was no more work for me. I couldn't go back. So um, applied for a medical pension, uh, hoping that this traumatic stress or whatever it was at that point um, would help me. Uh, you know, clearly, I could not go back to work. And I thought that if you got injured at work and couldn't go back, you were supposed to apply for medical attention and they'd take care of you. Well, uh, that was denied three times, including through a hearing and de completely denied uh, pension. So never got a penny from that. So um, I certainly spent my, a few years after that uh, feeling sorry for myself and angry and hypervigilant dealing with all those symptoms. And then uh, like many of us in public safety, we're kind of, uh, we're kind of bullheaded. And uh, I decided, well, I'm going to go to school and figure out what the heck is wrong with me. So I didn't even have a bachelor's degree at the time. I dropped out after a couple of years when starting law enforcement. So I had to go back to 10 years worth of college, uh, you know, internships, residencies after college, uh, all the way through from bachelor's to PhD and became a licensed uh, professional clinical counselor. Um, and uh, that's, that's led me to here, Thin Line Counseling. Amazing. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing that. I know that it's hard to share sometimes because especially when you're in this role where your job is to always help everybody else. Sometimes it's hard to then get to the point where you understand that you also need help for yourself. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and what you said about therapists, I hear often uh, being cried. I have guys too, who said that they went to therapist and the therapist cried or their mouth was open the whole time. And they were like, okay, now what do I do with you? And that's where I, I'm very big on stressing that anybody who does go to therapy, make sure that you interview them because you need to, they need to understand your life as a first responder. Um, and you need to know how many first responders have they worked with and, and what is their experience with them? Because it is such a different world and people don't understand, um, and not discounting traumas that other people do experience, but the traumas that first responders experience are just very different. Mm -hmm. um, and most people don't understand. So finding that therapist, which is one reason why I really wanted you in here was for, for everybody to understand that, that it is important to get that therapist and to keep digging and keep searching and keep finding if you don't find a therapist that you connect with, that to definitely make sure that you keep digging until you find, you know, a Dr. Wilkins, you know? And I even tell people, uh, you know, just because I have public safety experience doesn't mean I'm absolutely going to gonna fit with you. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe you work in public safety full time and you want somebody that has nothing to do with it. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a, as kind of uh, more of a comfort. I, I, I've seen that before, but I even tell people in my office that if I'm not the fit for you, just because I'm public safety and, and the, the, the people that work for me uh, had been in the military, if we're not a fit for you, 
uh, we'll help you find somebody that is. You know, I, I, I think I'm very passionate about that because I was in all effective purposes told that nobody could help me. So uh, that that that's definitely a passion. Uh, fortunately, I don't have to do that too often. And I get uh, I get what I call borrowed credit. Uh, from from public safety members that come in, and I certainly don't take that that lightly. But that borrowed credit that you know, I, I don't know what your shooting was like, but I know what shootings are like, and I don't know what your car wreck was like, but I know what car wrecks are like. I don't know what your victim that you saw was like, but I know those victims. So, you know, I get some of that sense of when you walk into a room and you just know the other person uh, in the other room knows, you yeah. know, that they've they've been through something similar. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's it. Like I have in the unit section of, of my group as well, there is lists and lists for UK, um, Australia, North America of all different trauma therapists, of retreats, of, of all different helplines, suicide helplines. Everything is in there because one size doesn't fit all. Sure. So it's yeah. so important to definitely get there. Um, so one thing, there, there's some things that come up quite often um, that I hear and I was wondering if we could touch on some of those if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, actually, before we do that, let's actually explain to people what EMDR and what, what the difference is between trauma therapies, EMDR and stuff, because um, as I said, I'm a huge proponent of EMDR. So let's do that first. Um, if you could explain what it is and the other types of therapies and treatments that you do as well. Sure. So uh, the EMDR uh, that you're speaking of is eye movement desensitization reprocessing. So uh, a pretty long name. It, it's kind of taken just on the moniker EMDR uh, for a lot. People actually even call me and ask if I do EMDR. Uh, and, and I read a book from Francine Shapiro not too long ago, uh, who was the creator of EMDR, that, that wishes that she'd have called it reprocessing therapy. That would have been so much easier to deal with. But uh, and when it was first started, it was more of a desensitization and not necessarily reprocessing that was kind of added later through, uh, through science and through experimentation. So, so reprocessing therapy, a lot of times is what I kind of call it in my office uh, once we get past the EMDR moniker, just a little easier to say. So, so um, EMDR uh, it is uh, based on what we call the adaptive information processing model. And it's the way that we as EMDR therapists understand how the brain works, especially after trauma. So an example of that is uh, we have a couple of parts of the brain that, that we'll look at during trauma or high stress therapy or uh, psychology. And one of them is the prefrontal cortex. It's on the front of the brain. It's what I call the, the thinking brain. And it's on both hemispheres. And those hemispheres will come into play here in a minute. It's what I call the thinking brain. It makes long-term decisions. Uh, it's not fully formed until age 25. So, you know, some of us are carrying a gun at 21 without a fully formed prefrontal cortex. But um, it, it makes the long-term decisions. Can we afford this mortgage? Should I change jobs? Should I get married? The other part that we look at is the limbic system. And most of you have heard it referred to as the fight or flight part of the brain. Uh, and now we're kind of identifying that it may be fight, flight, or freeze. There's some other reactions, but that is the, uh, the fight or flight part of the brain. And clearly we need that because if we have an emergency going on and the prefrontal cortex is thinking about what to do and evaluating some options, uh, we're in a lot of trouble. So uh, we need that we need that limbic system to react. And it reacts uh, thousands of times faster than the prefrontal cortex. So uh, information comes in, it gets sent to both of them. The limbic system reacts faster, gets us out of trouble. That's what makes us cram our brakes when somebody else crams their brakes. It's how we react. It's one of the reasons that we're all taught to say certain things when we draw our weapon on somebody so we can get that rhythm. We don't have to think about it. Well, the problem with that is during times of high stress or acute trauma, uh, not only does that limbic system change in size, parts of it gets bigger, parts of it gets smaller, which is really strange to see on a brain scan, but it kind of takes over. And one of the reasons we figured this out was we took a bunch of 18 year olds, they just joined the military, we scanned their brain, they went to combat, they came back, we scanned their brain again. And uh, Many of you have seen the brain scans with the different colors light up in the brain. And that tells me about blood flow, what's working, what's not in essence. And no matter what questions we asked them, that all their answers were coming from the limbic system. Well, that's pretty handy for cover and concealment. Not so handy for, hey, honey, where do you want to go to dinner tonight? So everything kind of becomes an emergency. Uh, here's the other reason that we know that that limbic system kind of kicks in and takes over and is so strong. Uh, when we have a real emergency, when we have a real life or death situation, this is our limbic system's job. Uh, it speeds up our heart so we get more blood. We breathe faster to get more oxygen. It heats up our body so our tendons and ligaments won't tear. You know, so if we're jumping out of a cruiser or or out of an ambulance to go deal with something. 
Uh, it shuts off our digestive system because as it turns out, it's not so handy after you use the bathroom in the middle of a fight. So it shuts it off. That's why you get dry mouth when you're nervous. It gives us an adrenaline dump so you're stronger. And you've heard stories of people lifting cars off of people and uh, you know crazy street things. And it hones in our senses or what many of us have called tunnel vision. So that's what we need our limbic system to do. That's, that's an emergency response. Well, what does an anxiety attack look like, a panic attack look like? What does uh, uh, greatly over angered look like? Heart racing, breathing fast, sweating for no reason because the body heats up, stomach's all messed up, shaking from adrenaline, your senses are all messed up. So clearly when those things are being activated, it's the limbic system. Now, there's, there's, no way, there's no way about it. If we're just starting to get agitated at something, it's not really the limbic system. The limbic system we need, but it's kind of dumb. It's an on and off switch. Uh, the other way that I describe it, and this will help understand EMDR, is I see the limbic system as kind of the smoke detector of the brain. And if you're cooking dinner and you burn dinner and smoke alarm goes off, it's not that big of a deal. You open the windows and doors, you get all the smoke out, uh, you laugh at each other, then you go out to eat. No big deal. But if that smoke alarm goes off at 3 a.m., it's a little different story, right? Where's the dog? Where's the kids? Is there smoke in the room? How do we get out of here? Why did I put my shoes so far away? It's a whole different ball game. Well, the point though, same smoke detector, same smoke detector. Um, all that smoke detector knows to do is to see smoke and tell you loudly that it sees smoke. And in fact, and this is where talk therapy uh, can sometimes uh, not help uh, traditional talk therapy with trauma, um, is that if you say you do burn dinner and you know the room's getting smoky, you can get up on your chair, get right next to that smoke detector and say, listen, I appreciate all you do for our family, but I don't need you to go off. It's just smoke from dinner. It's still going to go off. You can't talk it out of not going off. Unless you take the batteries out of the thing or the smoke is gone, it's still going to go off, right? So keep those kind of brain things in mind as we talk about what EMDR does. So uh, EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing again, um, we understand that uh, when you go to things like the third stage of sleep or REM sleep, rapid eye movement, uh, your eyes are moving. Clearly, you're not looking at anything. Your eyes are closed. One of the reasons that it does that is that's stimulating both hemispheres of the brain. It's one of the few times where you can use both hemispheres at the same time. Uh, you know, one side's controlled by the other, one eye's controlled by, by the opposite. So, so we do uh, that, that, or in, in REM sleep, that's when your, your uh, chaos from today is supposed to be kind of processed over and into that logic side, into that other hemisphere and put away. And the way I like to describe the logic side is two plus two is four, whether you like it or not. Doesn't matter if you hate math, love math, failed out of math. It just is. It's just a thing. And if you think about a lot of the traumas and difficult critical incidents that we go to, it's just a thing. It's just a thing we put away. Of course, you hate it for the family and it's sad and you don't have to deal with it again. But it's just over there in the logic side, just sitting in a drawer in case you need it. While some of those traumas, and we know why, but some of those traumas get stuck in the other hemisphere, get stuck in that chaos. And it's kind of like jamming a square peg into a round hole. Uh, what drawer on the logic side are you supposed to put away uh, seeing a lady burn alive? There's no drawer for that. We weren't made that way. So it kind of stays in what I call purgatory uh, and becomes a raw nerve. And if, uh, if you have kids and they've fallen and scraped their knee on the concrete, it's a raw nerve. You don't have to touch it to make it hurt. You can blow air in its general direction or look at it funny and it hurts because it's a raw nerve. Well, that's where these uh, maladaptively processed memories are. That's where these are stuck at. Some things get stuck in purgatory. Some things get stuck as a raw nerve, and it doesn't take much to flip that nerve. The example I always use is after uh, seeing that difficult wreck, in my mind, over the next few years, every traffic violation might as well have been a felony. Now, that sounds crazy for me to say. If you don't use your turn signal, it's a felony. Oh, it's annoying, but it's really not a felony. It's something you have to be hypervigilant about. But in my brain, in my limbic system, everything was being – that could – turn into a wreck, uh, whether it was related to that wreck or not, I don't know if she used her turn signal, uh, suddenly became a life or death emergency. And, you know, as, as many of you have responded to critical incidents or had family members that have done so, that's exhausting. That's exhausting. And I just thought I was tired and not sleeping well. Turns out I had a mental health problem, had a disorder that I was dealing with. So, so we use, I talked about that left brain, right brain in the eye. So we do what I kind of like to call reversing the polarity. Uh, we give part of your brain uh, a stimulus, whether it be by uh, a tactile vibration in a hand or by a tap um, or by eye movement, which is the e, uh, EM part of uh, EMDR. Um, and we kind of replicate that, that REM sleep at a different frequency. You're not going to sleep. You're not hypnotized. And 
what a lot of uh, my patients find is that they just start burning through these memories. And the idea is to first desensitize from it and then reprocess that memory into something more helpful. And that's what you get. Um, and I'll say this last about, uh, about EMDR, unless there's more questions, but um, I, I, had, uh, I had heard of EMDR. I was doing some rational talk therapy and doing really well with, with patients, I believe, and, and helping some people. And if you work in trauma, you're going to hear about EMDR. So I made the mistake of looking it up on YouTube. And it was this weird person waving their hand in front of people and asking if they felt better. And I thought, that's ridiculous and I'm never going to do it. Um, in fact, I would be almost antagonistic about it. People would call and say, oh, you, uh, it says that you do trauma, work with trauma, Are you, do you do EMDR? And I thought, that's, I'd tell them, that's ridiculous. Get in here and do some real rational talk therapy. And let's get this straightened out because thinking fixes everything, you know, unlike your, uh, what I just said about the smoke detector. Well, uh, fortunately for me, uh, I went to a conference, a post-critical incident seminar where we help lots of officers and I saw EMDR uh, used. And in 30 minutes, it did what I'm not doing in three months uh, with somebody. And, and this somebody, it was somebody that, that had held on to a, a trauma, a raw nerve for about 15 years, and it was a tough one. And in 30 minutes, they were better. They didn't forget it. They didn't have amnesia. Of course, they still miss the person that they, that happened to and hate the, the sights of what they had to see. But the dysfunctional motion just wasn't there anymore. And what we've kind of uh, I've put into a, a little more tight sentence these days to explain to people when they come in is uh, with EMDR and the a, that adaptive information processing model I talked about, we know that today's dysfunctional emotions, so anger, anxiety, depression, guilt, they're dysfunctional. They're not helping us at all. Those emotions are caused by previous life events, and that can be age zero to yesterday. It doesn't have to be childhood. Zero to yesterday that left us feeling helpless hopeless, not good enough, or that we couldn't handle it. And if you uh, think about it, those feelings are being re-triggered today. Not necessarily the event. The event may not be something that you're thinking about, but that helpless, hopeless, not good enough, and can't handle it gets re-triggered today. And uh, if you think about it in the context of what was going on um, in, in, just in my brain alone, uh, following that collision, that's what it was. I felt helpless and hopeless, and not good enough, and then I couldn't fix everything. And so I was hypervigilant and angry and drinking too much and, and angry to my family and hated my job, a job that I'd loved and, you know, ended with a, a whole bunch of uh, people with rank on their collar sitting around me telling me I wasn't uh, that good of an employee at the moment. So, so, yeah. so that's EMDR kind of in a nutshell. I know it doesn't necessarily explain the mechanics of it or how, how it all works, but mm -hmm. we're trying to take those dysfunctional emotions those, those very difficult, helpless, hopeless, not good enough uh, thoughts, which hit us at our lowest and get it over into that file where the brain says, okay, that was terrible, but okay, I'm not those things. Yeah. And that's, that's where um, we had Jeremy Davis on who is how I met you. I and Jeremy you. was telling us like with, he was teaching about PTSD, moral injury and compassion fatigue. And that moral injury is where that hits that value, your values, where you're, you're doing something, you're seeing something that goes completely against your values. Mm -hmm. Although it's something that you need to be doing in the duties of your job mm -hmm. to be keeping people safe. And that can completely, as you're saying, if you don't have a compartment for that, and it, it can definitely be living in that, that space where, mm -hmm. Yeah, where there just wasn't a spot in your brain for it because it didn't work in with your values and stuff. Yeah, but. and and it wasn't not being tough enough. I'm a big, strong dude. I competed in powerlifting and strongman. I was uh, absolutely dedicated to that job. I love stepping out of that cruiser and putting my campaign hat on and taking taking care of situations. Uh, I'm a strong guy, a very type A personality, but here I was falling apart. And yeah. You know, if you'd have asked me five years before that, I'd have said, no way would I ever seek therapy or talk. It just talked to e even up here about those problems. Uh, mm -hmm. Joke's on me. Here I sit doing therapy now. So, uh, yeah. and, and Jeremy Davis, you mentioned, I don't know if he's watching, but, or will watch. He likes to be humble about it, but it's soon to be Dr. Jeremy Davis. Yes. We were talking to him just as he was, uh, just finishing up his papers, he actually made time for that. It was like, how are you fitting all this in? But you guys never stop wanting to help people. 
sure. and get the word out. And, and that's through and through. And the thing is, is, is yeah, people do not put themselves every single time when they're going to their job, when they are going out, knowing that they are putting themselves in danger, that is not a weak person. No. Not no. by any sort. And, and that's what anybody who comes on board with me too, I'm like, we have no judgment with anybody here. Everybody has a story. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. if they are angry at us, if they are, you know, as soon as somebody is angry and snarky or like getting mad at us, um, which I especially find on my, like my ads that are out there, I first look and see if they're first responder. Yeah. And if they are, okay. I get curious. Cause I'm like, this person no. has a story and there's a story there. And, and we can't because every single person in here has their own personal story. Sure. And that story is what got them to where they are. It's, you, it's the story that got them to become a first responder. And then what led them throughout that story continuing is what got them to the place that they are in today. And so those people in my world are the strongest people that I've ever known. And if any of them are short fused, um, addictions, any type of addictions. We have alcohol, we have sexual, we have um, all different types like drugs, every, like there's so many different addictions. Um, I'm even going to be as bold to say right now that as soon as I hear that there is any sort of physical stuff happening too, it's wrong. And it's wrong that it got to that point, but I don't judge. And the first thing that I always do, I say to my husband, whenever there's anything, I'm like, what's their story? I'm like, what is it? I go, what kind of a first responder were they? Look earlier in their career. Were they somebody that was, um, like you said, that was there, that was the go-getter, that was doing the reports, that was on the job, that was helping everybody that was in there? Were they that person? Mm -hmm. And then did they, over time, start developing different behaviors, different addictions, different habits, different like motivation and drive going down, anger coming in. You know, we don't judge. We have to go back and trace the steps. And and the thing is, is with the body and its stress system is the traumas, 100% are big stressors, but so yeah. is having a child. Sure. So is getting married and moving in with somebody and all of these really good things that happen in your life. So is are the, the, the things that can be happening in your personal life, like a, a, a sick parent or child or financial issues or, or a divorce or separation, those things as well, all take hits to your stress system and they sure. all add up. So we need to look at all of them and add them up. And when we get on calls with people, we usually start asking them about sleep and anger and addictions. And we go back into it and and then start saying, okay, what happened six months, a year before that? Like you said, Mm -hmm. it's not necessarily that day. Yeah. And, and you look at the different kind of traumas you're talking about uh, big T trauma is kind of easy to figure out, right? Nine 11 car crashes, uh, loss of a child going to critical events, but we also have little T trauma and they're not little T because they're not important or impactful. They're just more chronic and what we call adverse life events. Yes. And these are the things that happen. Like you said, having a kid, having a sick kid, uh, a divorce, a parent leaving when you're younger, uh, they all add to, to the whole thing. And, and, yeah. and like you said, nobody's trying to make an excuse for why people uh, lash out or hyper vigilant or over angry or, or, or say the things they shouldn't say. Uh, nobody's trying to make an excuse, but, but when you think of it in that context of, uh, of that smoke alarm and, and going off. Every time I see one of those videos where, um, you know, so somebody may be losing their cool and also maybe losing their cool. Uh, not only do I want to see uh, what led up to it, of course, we all want to see that. And we're uh, sometimes surprised to see that the officer did really well up until that point uh, of losing it. Uh, but I want to see the last five years, not just the last five minutes. You yes. know, what, we're not trying to use this as an excuse for somebody doing inappropriate, but wow, doesn't it make sense? Doesn't it make sense that, that all this stuff adds together? Doesn't it make sense that this can be a career ending or life ending problem? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I want to see the, what, what, what was the last five years, not just the last five minutes. And yeah. you know, I, don't, I don't want to <clears throat> negate things that, that are done incorrectly. We still have to make good decisions and we still have to uh, you know, hold ourselves to a higher standard. That's why many of us join uh, public safety is to do so. But uh, wow, doesn't it make sense that all that stuff does add together? Yeah. 
Absolutely. So I have an officer as well that, and I'm, I have permission to say what I'm going to say. Um, and in his career too, he had an amazing career. He, but it was tough. He, and it wasn't trauma induced um, in the sense of car crashes and, and victims and things like that. He was going through a divorce had a custody battle at the same time, this is in the UK, as the London riots. He was a sergeant in public order, pulling 15, 16 hour days back to back to back, and not only in charge of his own safety and welfare, but that of his team as well, every day in those riots. So mm -hmm. for the entire riots, that pushed his body. A year later, they did the Olympics, and it was a whole year going into it of planning and prep that was a lot of work, working with the military, training, everybody working together. And then during the Olympics, him and his team were on the only village area that was 24 seven. So he was working 16, 18, 19 hour days straight on during that. Mm -hmm. And once we started looking at all of this until his career ended, he was charged because of an incident where it got a little bit aggressive. They weren't, um, they were cleared of all charges, the three of them that were there, but we looked at everything leading into it and leading up to it and how the anger and the short fuse and his relationship with everybody at home and his family and his sleep and all of these things that led to that. And then it was three years during that trial. And then it took, it was three years and three months from the time of the charge until his, his, he was cleared of all charges until he was actually discharged. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know the details as to why they discharged him even after he'd been cleared of the charges, mm -hmm. but we looked at everything that happened and he looks back now and he says that had that not happened, he wouldn't have met me and we wouldn't have got his stress system back on track mm -hmm. and now he has a relationship with his kids because he's less short fused he's sure. gotten all of that under control but had he kept going in that role in public order front lines like right now we have all these protests we had covid and then we have these protests so we're dealing with the mental side of everybody being all the negativity that is worse than it ever has been the thought of your life being at risk more so every time you go. Chicago is no days off at the moment. They're pulling 12 to 15 hour shifts back to back, no days off. Wow. That That is pushing them so much that smaller and smaller T's are going to hit their body, hit their mind, hit that limbic system as you're talking about more and more that they need, you know, your help and they need my help more after this because of even non-traumatic incidences. Like it all adds up in the career, all of the stressors sure. that come into that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so with that as well, I know one thing quite often is I hear about addictions, mm -hmm. um, sexual addiction, addictions, um, alcohol, drugs, um, any kinds of addictions. And quite often people don't relate that. They think that's different from PTSD, different from the traumas. Can you explain first off if it's different or if it is connected and why? Sure. So, so I'll say first with the exception of a physical addiction, you know, there, you can't get physically addicted to opiates and physically addicted to alcohol and your body crave it. But so with the exception of those physical addictions, uh, I find it very difficult and, and frustrating that, uh, that alcohol use disorders or cigarette use disorders or, or uh, any kind of substance abuse disorders uh, are listed as a disorder uh, outside of that, that, the physical addiction. And that's because I don't see it as a disorder. I see those things as a symptom of a bigger problem. Yes. Uh, people don't typically drink just because uh, for no reason. Uh, people don't usually turn to substances for, for whatever reason. For, for no reason. What, what void are they feeling? What demon are they trying to get rid of? You know, I, I was certainly suspect of that. You know, I, I, I was willing to, to mention and admit an increase in alcohol use. Um, I didn't drink cheap alcohol because I thought uh, it was cool. I drank it because I got rid of the demons at night and let me sleep. Now, what I know about that, that 
uh, sleep science now is I was actually making it worse for myself. Uh, turns out alcohol is a depressant, as most people know. I did not. And uh, it makes my sleep worse. You never get to that third stage of sleep. You never get to REM sleep. And those things that help you deal with the stress of your life are not helping. So in my mind, and maybe some psychologists disagree, those are, those are symptoms, uh, not disorders. And, and really, when you look at any of the symptoms, I do a talk across the nation. In addition to my uh, practice here, I'm the clinical director for a group called The Wounded Blue, which is a national nonprofit out of Las Vegas, started by a Las Vegas uh, former Metro Lieutenant, good friend of mine, Randy Sutton. Uh, if you've watched Cops anytime in the 80s and 90s, you, you know Randy Sutton from Vegas. Uh, well, he is now uh, the, the president of this company, started this company, and we, uh, it, you know, it's support and assistance for injured officers. So uh, my role in that is, is working with the peer teams across the nation. So I get to go all over the place and give this talk to different public safety agencies because of that group and, and, and just being called upon uh, from my own practice. And I call it the real signs of PTSD. And uh, what I mean by that is nobody comes in and, and tells me that they've had a critical event with effortful reminders uh, to get away from reminders, that they have flashbacks and this nightmares and that, you know, this has impacted the way in which they live their life. Nobody comes in and gives me kind of the clinical things about PTSD. People come in and say, doc, I'm miserable all the time. I'm sad. I'm angry. I can't stop yelling at people. I've been written up at work three times when I used to be the star employee. I'm drinking all the time. Um, you know, I'm thinking of harming myself. My wife has left. My kids have left. My kids are scared of me. Nobody will talk to me. I have no more friends anymore. Those are the real signs of PTSD. Now, if some of those things are happening, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the disorder that's going on. Uh, but that's what it looks like here on my couch. That's what it looks like. Nobody comes in and says uh, flat out they have PTSD because of this critical incident. Uh, maybe some people have done some reading up and they have a concern about it. But those are the real signs of PTSD to me. Those are the real signs or will at least say traumatic stress. Maybe it hasn't gotten to the point of PTSD. Maybe it's acute stress or some other kind of specified stress disorder. But, but that's, that's what I see. I mean, that, that's what comes in here. Um, and I, I get a lot of talk uh, from, from public safety supervisors a lot. How do I, how do I know if my supervisee is, is May, might be dealing with PTSD. Well, one, watch for the critical event, of course. You talked about the, the gentleman from London. I mean, how can we not uh, expect that there to be some changes, even in differing levels, maybe not to the level that he got, but even in differing levels, that, that's pretty, pretty clear cut uh, that that is a change in their system, uh, change in the way they're having to operate. And again, no sleep, probably no good food, no, no uh, relaxation, no working out. You know, nothing that's going to get them in line for, for good rest or mindfulness. But, but how, do I, how do I watch that? And that's what I tell them. Don't watch for the critical event in which they now have flashbacks or nightmares and try to avoid those and it changes. Watch for those things. They're not sleeping anymore. They're in the middle of a terrible divorce. Their kids are scared of them. They've gone from your star employee to being, you having to write them up all the time for anger, you know, or, or recklessness or, yeah, so uh, tying that back all into to any of those uh, high risk things, you know, th there's a, a kind of a, a known known thing among military who also treat for a long time that a lot of people will come back from combat and buy buy a really fast motorcycle and drive 140 miles an hour. It's the same thing, in my opinion. Uh, and the one that can be kind of controversial, uh, and it's certainly not an excuse for it, but infidelity sometimes is uh, a high risk uh, high risk event. You know, and that, that's not to say uh, to talk about individualities within a relationship that we need to talk about, but, but that also can be a high risk event. So, so anything that is uh, seeking high risk. Now, if you come back from combat and you really like to drive motorcycles fast, you do that, it doesn't mean you have PTSD, but maybe we should keep an eye out for that. You know, why are you driving the motorcycle fast? Why are you drinking? If you, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not anti-alcohol. Uh, if you go out and have a couple of beers with your friends or sit in the hot tub, that's great. In fact, um, I once responded to a critical event, after, an after debriefing critical event here, and they got me to, to talk about uh, uh, mental health and what to do after this, this critical event. And somebody said, well, what about alcohol? And uh, I said, well, don't worry about the alcohol, worry about the change in the alcohol. If you always go home and have two beers with your wife in the hot tub, go home with your wife and have two beers in the hot tub. You know, that's, that's not abnormal. I don't think you're going to hurt anything. If you go home and drink a 30 pack, we need to talk. Right? Yeah. If changing, we need to talk. And that's why those are the real symptoms of stress. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's that change in behaviors, those changes. And, mm-hmm. and um, I'm in some spouse groups as well, because I'm a spouse. And it's interesting that when they're coming in there and they're, they're talking about seeing these changes in their spouses. Um, so the thing is, is quite often they don't know how to be approaching it. Mm-hmm. Um, is there any advice? Cause we do have some spouses watching as well mm-hmm. or tips or tricks on things that like, I'm pretty much just like, Hey, give them a list of symptoms and, and like chronologically, like place it out, lay it out there for them. And mm-hmm. without judgment, just lay it out there for them, leave it and give it to them um, to process and think about it. Is there any um, tips that you have as well for spouses to maybe be able to get a spouse that's struggling on board with taking the steps to get the help or first of all, even acknowledging that something's going on? Sure. And I really like your idea of kind of being able to, to list out the symptoms uh, with, with something to add to that. So uh, when people do that, I go ahead and remind them, you list out the symptoms. You're, you're not saying things that aren't untrue. You're bringing your concerns uh, uh, to your spouse, which is, is, is what a relationship is all about. Uh, so, um, so give them that list, but keep in mind that you giving them the list may not go well the first time and it may not make an imagine or immediate change rather um but you've planted the seed Mm -hmm. right you planted the seed because here's how i uh conceptualize kind of in my own head what it looks like when the spouse finally realizes they need help Uh, i can have those list of symptoms and to be perfectly honest i had a list of those symptoms uh, that were brought to my attention by my spouse and but i i felt like i could explain all of them well, of course I'm angry all the time. People are terrible. Uh, of course I'm hypervigilant all the time. There's murderers out there that want to hurt me, right? Mm-hmm. Of course I'm uh, mean all the time. I've been sued, you know? So, so I felt like I could explain all those away. Of course I drink. I work night shift. I can't sleep during the daytime, right? But, but the seed was planted and, and it wasn't until, and this is the kind of thing that, that how I conceptualize it, it wasn't until I started to feel like a failure as a husband and a father as an officer that I finally went, oh, okay, uh, n- now I see it. And uh, I don't think I was a failure, but I was certainly failing. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't want to say failure because we bounced back from it, but, yeah. but I was certainly failing. Uh, I, I was failing. Nobody was getting hurt. Uh, I've never been physically abusive to, 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 to family, but um, they were certainly being emotionally hurt. Uh, yeah. and, and, and not necessarily of my own purposeful aggravation. Uh, but I finally figured out I was failing. Uh, my kids were scared that I'd yell so much. Uh, my wife couldn't talk to me. We felt like roommates. And I finally started to figure out that I was failing at that. And so the reason I bring that up is because of the type of people that I work with, whether it be public safety members or military or or just type A individuals or, or individual with trauma. You don't have to uh, be in public safety to come here. I work with a lot of trauma. Another one of my specialties with EMDR is adults with childhood trauma because we, we treat that just a little bit differently in, in, in a concept model. But people don't come in here for maintenance. Uh, people don't come to my office and maybe they do others, uh, but people don't seek my help uh, when they're just a little upset and they had a big fight with their spouse. And they just want to make sure everything's okay. People come in here when they failed. You know, people come in here when they finally had to sit on the bed with their head in their hands and think, I don't know what to do here. I, I'm, I'm, I don't know what to do here. It's all falling apart. I have to reach out. Uh, and, and hopefully they reach out, uh, you know, to somebody who's competent in, in working with people like them or just competent in mental health. But uh, that, that's what I would kind of add to that list of symptoms is, you know, letting them know that you may not get through the first time. In fact, it may make your spouse angrier, but you've planted the seed and they're going to have to see that seed and they're going to have to eventually come to their own conclusion. I'm, I'm hurting. I'm screwed up. Yeah. Uh, and that is when the people like me reach out for help. Yeah. Um, so I do see some questions in the Facebook group and I am going to ask you them. Do you have time? I know that we've kind of gone over a bit in time. I wanted to ask you one other thing if you're good for time. Sure, I'm good. And I, I can't see the Facebook myself, so I'll be okay. glad to glad to hear those. Yeah, 
I'm a, I switch over every once in a while because it's a bit delayed from us. So okay. I'll, um, so first, I guess the question that I have before I'll get to the questions in the group is it's about suicide. Mm -hmm. So I have one client who, when we first met was suicidal. I am not PTSD. I'm not the therapy side. I'm only the physical side of things. Um, but we've talked a lot about suicide and when he's for him, it's, it's different than actually somebody else that I'll give you an example of as well for him. It's when he's having catastrophic thoughts, all of a sudden they just get too much and he doesn't think about it. He just, it happens. It's not premeditated. It's not anything. Um, we've been getting his stress system strong enough that he is now able to go to PTSD um, to, to treatment. Um, I do want to say him and I always talk about how much therapy sucks and <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, I, I said that to you, like, it sucks. Honestly, like who wants to go and dig up these friggin' traumas? It yeah, yeah. sucks. Getting out the other end is so much better. And that's where he's at now, right. but we still, we laugh about how much therapy sucks in a good way. So I do want people to know that it is. It really does suck. It sucks going in and talking about these things. But him and I were talking about a suicide where one of his colleagues did did commit suicide. Was um, I don't even know the word to say that he ended up he he passed, mm -hmm. and we were talking about it. And he was, and he was asking me, he's like, why would he do that? Like, why, why didn't he come to me? I talked to him the week before. Why didn't he? And so I asked him, I said, why didn't you go to other people as well? And he had said, because I know that when I was in the police service before he was medical doubt, he goes, I was able to hide it enough from everybody that everybody thought that I was strong and I had it all together and I was doing okay. Mm -hmm. He goes, and if I talked to somebody, it would mean that I had a chink in my armor. Right. And I asked him and I said, okay, this other gentleman, had he talked to you, would you have thought anything less of him? Would you have thought that he had a chink in his armor now and he wasn't as good of an officer? He's like, hell no. <laughs> like, no way. He goes, he was an amazing officer. He's just got these demons. So I guess like this is the conversations we've been having and we have been talking about how can we get others to talk more openly and admit when they are struggling so much and for them to understand that this does not mean that they're not strong and that they were not good responders or mm -hmm. that they are still not good responders and amazing responders. How can we explain it to them that them reaching out is going to make them stronger and better? Do you have any advice, any thoughts, anything on this? Yeah. Well, let, let me first put into kind of, um, kind of put into a different thought of what suicide is, because uh, to be honest, I, I had a lot of trouble figuring out and understanding suicide when I was really healthy, right? I, I couldn't understand it. I knew I responded to things, uh, calls of it and, and people were at their worst and and even though you might hear that gosh I can't believe they did it they were always so happy all the time and they hit it like the gentleman you were talking about but also when you start to get more of the story you hear that they have a lot of turmoil going on and whether it be big t or little t trauma you know those adverse life events that uh, you kind of start to put the pieces together you know um, what I always say about suicide, because I try to do it in a little different manner than, you know, kind of the clinical response you get from everybody. So, so first that response, of course, is get them help, period. You know, don't, don't let them be alone. And, and there's some logistical things that are important, but we're starting to figure those out in public safety, right? If somebody calls and says they're suicidal, we really don't leave until uh, that we can articulate that they're uh, with a friend or in the hospital or, you know, have been admitted into like a mental, uh, mental location. So, Here's how I think about suicide, and this made a lot. Uh, th this made it a lot more sense to me. Suicide comes from hopelessness, uh, just like it says: hopelessness, no hope, zero, none, absolutely gone, no hope. 
And what I find is that if somebody has one thing, one thing of hope to hold on to, uh, and they know that, then it's not hopeless. It's not good, but it's not hopeless, right? And if you think about suicide in that manner of hopelessness, to me, it's kind of a light bulb. It almost, it, it almost makes more sense. How could somebody finally get to the point where it's completely overwhelming, even though we've all been telling them we're head, there to help and to call us and we stop by and we check on them? It's because they got hopeless. It's because they got hopeless. They got to the bottom of the hope. There, there's none left. So even though that's not uh, directly, you know, a step-by-step -step program of how to approach somebody about suicide, I think when we talk to people and keep that hopelessness in mind, that, that that's a big problem about it, I think it makes it a lot easier to talk about instead of that clinical, gosh, if somebody's going to try and take their life, we need to do something about it. We have to say the right things. And if we say the wrong things, it's going to make them worse. They're hopeless. Give them hope. And, and that doesn't mean remind them that they love uh, classic cars and then leave, right? Don't give them one thing that they like. Uh, make sure they got one thing to hold on to. And I think if you think about it and talk about it in that context, uh, that, that it makes it a lot easier to see when somebody's getting hopeless, to see when somebody's getting to that, that end of the rope or, or at that bottom. So um, I, I think that that is, um, I think that's extremely important. Um, I also believe that, that lots of people have been there, even though we may never know that of the person sitting next to us. Yeah. And I, I'm a firm believer uh, of Henry Nguyen's statement that the best healer is the wounded healer. So, um, you know, if, if you've been there, you already know what it looks like. And, and, and I've never seen somebody commit suicide that didn't have hopelessness. So I, I think that's, that's a big key. If even not a systemic way to talk to somebody, I think if you approach it in that manner, that that solves the puzzle right there. That that gives you your opening. Uh, instead of, hey, tell me what's going on wrong in your life. You know, mm. look for that hopelessness and then you'll know. Yeah. And that's, I think too, like you say, you don't always know it until later on. And that's, I, I have in my program where they have told me after months when they're starting to get out of it and feeling better that they tell me that they were, they were like contemplating. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea because had I known I'm not a therapist that I would have instantly pulled out my list of referrals. I'd be like, you know, go see Dr. Wilkins get, you know, because I'm in the physical realm. But as you said, I guess we talk about hope and it's not, but it is. Yeah. And that's where, that's why I've got my list of referrals and that's why I have you here today. No, um, no. Okay. So let's go through these questions. Let no. me find. Okay. So, um, so I have, does EMDR have to know what trauma they are fighting for EMDR to work? So he can say that there are a few things that he believes are traumas mm -hmm. and he can think of, but they don't necessarily cause a physical response in him. Great question. So the, the, the immediate answer would be no. And here's why. Uh, a couple of things come to mind. One Yes, we're treating critical events. We're, we're treating maladaptive process memories or unprocessed memories. But memory doesn't necessarily mean an event. Now, it can be an event. You know, I talked about the wreck that I went to. That's pretty easy to point out, right? That one's pretty easy to figure out. Not at the time, didn't know what I was talking about. But as I kind of track back, like, oh, that's, that's stuck there. That's the raw nerve that keeps getting flicked every time somebody does something wrong in front of me, right? But remember, uh, memories can be periods of time, uh, life events. You know, it doesn't have to be the moment that dad walked out. It doesn't have to be the moment you saw the physical assault. If you were bullied for five years in school, that's a memory. And yeah, we may end up trying to, to snag one or two memories of that maybe that, that may not feel traumatizing so just so we can do some processing. But no, absolutely, you, you, you can absolutely do uh, EMDR with periods of time, because we're going to have enough questions to kind of get that reactivated. We're going to have enough questions uh, about about getting that that memory or that feeling going again. That that if if you have a long-standing emotion, hopeless, helpless, not good enough, it doesn't take much for me to get that started again. You know, uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of coaxing to get you back in that thought and. 
uh, that your brain can kind of figure out what we call a touchstone event or, or when it initially started. So, and, and keep in mind too, something I'll say is, you know, we're not using psychoanalysis here. We're not Sigmund Freud that's going back to one moment at age three where this one bad thing happened. That can absolutely be a case, uh, you know, if somebody knows the trauma. But here, here's the other thing about, uh, cool thing about EMDR is it's not exposure therapy. So uh, exposure therapy, which I will admit I'm not certified in, so I don't want to misspeak about it, but uh, has a low success rate when it comes to PTSD. Uh, and uh, in essence, it's you telling the story over and over again with every detail until you, in their opinion, start to desensitize from it. Well, uh, exposure therapy works great if you're scared of elevators and you just took a, uh, a job on the 30th floor. We got to get you in the elevator eventually, right? But we're going to do that through long-term exposure, slow exposure. Retelling a trauma re-traumatizes you. Retelling a trauma sets the alarm off again. So you might as well be standing there. Now, I know that exposure therapy has worked for some people, so I'm not knocking it as a system as a whole, but here's why I like EMDR more. I don't need a single detail about the trauma, not one. I'm gonna ask you seven questions when we get started with EMDR, and all seven are about how this impacts you now. I don't need to know any details. If you wanna tell me details, I'm all ears. Sometimes that cathartic therapy of getting things off your chest, I do find helpful for people, but I don't need a single detail. As a matter of fact, um, I've worked uh, very recently with a, a member of a government agency that we'll just say doesn't like to give away secrets. And uh, their person was uh, dealing with, with PTSD and because of uh, security concerns, they couldn't tell me a single detail about what they were dealing with. And that's okay. It might have made my life a little easier, but uh, we're not dealing with details that are causing problems. We're dealing with feelings of helpless and hopeless and not good enough and can't handle it. So as long as I can see that changing through the process, I don't need a single detail. In fact, you can change the names or places if you want to. As long as it's reactivated in your mind by the, the things that we do, it'll take care of itself. Uh, the brain's an organ. And if you, if you think about it, if you get a cut on your arm, uh, as long as you keep it dry and closed and covered, it'll heal itself, right? That's what the body does. Now, this is 2020, go get some stitches. But uh, the brain's an organ. It's going to heal itself. Now, if you think about that arm, though, if there's a splinter or an infection in that arm, we got to get it taken care of. It's not going to fix itself, right? So if there's a rawness or a raw nerve or, or a splinter, per se, in the brain about that memory, it may not heal itself. So, uh, But that's the great thing about it is um, – there, there's a, a percentage of people that we kind of end up going with uh, what we call an affect scan and just running off what you feel as opposed to what the trauma is because we can't figure out what it is. Awesome. But no, that's very interesting. Um, okay. So we have, how do you know if you're going to a good office that offers EMDR? So the first thing you can do is get on the Indrio website, the EMDR International Association. So they have a way that you can click find a therapist, you can find them in your area, and you can even click on the specialties. So Indrio is the certifying board for the formal training of EMDR. If you're going to be certified uh, as I am, or if you're going to move into the consultants uh, area as I am, uh, you have to have gone through an Indrio sponsored class. So um, that's how you know that they got the training that is the, the gold standard of EMDR uh, is through Imdria. And it doesn't have to be their company. It's just Imdria is the, is the certification and training arm of that. How do you so, spell that? Uh, it's it just EMDRIA. So uh, it's the EMDR part and then International Association. So, so IA. Okay. And you can, uh, again, you can click find a therapist. Now that's going to kind of give you that precursory level of their level of training, maybe when they were certified. Uh, some of some you will find in there are specialties. I think if you look under my name, you'll find things like military, public safety, adults with childhood trauma, which are my three specialties, uh, or just trauma, you know, trauma victims. They don't have to be in public safety. So that'll get you started kind of in the area. Okay. Uh, and then don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, the first thing I want to know or that I tell people is what is EMDR and why are we doing it? right? There's no secret pill to me. I never want to be one of those doctors that says, here, do this and you'll be fine. I want you to know, and I have, I have something I call my first day speech uh, that I give to people before they leave. And I want them to know kind of what I talked about the brain, what EMDR is going to do. And granted, they don't walk out of here excited and everything's great. 
but I haven't had a single person walk out of here that didn't hear that stuff and think, wow, okay, I'm not crazy or stupid or educated or dumb or weak or can't handle it. This yeah. is a limbic system problem and we're going to take care of it because we have a way to do it. There's no secrets to me. Uh, you know, one of the reasons that I'm moving into the consultant ranks as a consultant in training now is I love teaching this stuff. I, I, love, I want other people to embrace this EMDR and I want people that have been trained in it that are moving to the certification level, you know, to have some good consultation of people that have been there and done that. So uh, I had great teachers along the way. Um, you know, uh, what my, the guy I kind of consider my mentor in EMDR uh, received a, a, a Lifetime Achievement Award uh, last year. It was the first one to ever get it uh, from uh, Francine Shapiro, who passed away last year. She was the creator of EMDR. So, you know, I want to learn from those people. I want to learn from the people that have been there, done that. Um, and so when you go and talk to a therapist about EMDR, um, you know, maybe they, they explain it in a very different way. This is how I explain it and how I've come to do it over the years. And of course it amalgamates. And if you came and saw me next week, it might be a little bit different. I'm always thinking about this stuff and how to get better, but uh, talk to them, find out what they know, find out what their, what their uh, belief of EMDR and how it works. And if they don't know how it works and they can't tell you anything about it and they're just going to go through the mechanics, I might be a little concerned. Okay. Yeah. So make sure that they, can explain it absolutely as well. Yeah, yep. Okay. So I see that there's six comments and I'm only having four pull up. So I think that I'm missing one. But the other thing is there's a couple of people in here talking about somebody searched EMDR on Google Play and they found an app for four dollars or something. Can you explain what that would be? Sure. Um, versus what you do. Yeah, so um, what you're finding there is probably a software that will provide you what we call uh, alternating bilateral stimulation, bi bilateral alternating stimulation. So I talked a few minutes ago about kind of revol reversing the polarity, right? We're going to give your eyes or your hands or your ears or your body a stimulus that kind of activates that left brain, right brain. So we do that by, some, by something called bilateral alternating stimulation. Uh, whether it be eye movements back and forth, whether it be tapping, whether it be a vibration, uh, there's lots of different ways to do it. Eye movement being the, the first created, hence the name EMDR, the EM part. But um, it can be done in lots of different ways. So what you're likely seeing, and you can find them all over YouTube, you can find them all over different places, is probably a program that offers you some kind of bilateral alternating stimulation. So um, here is my concern uh, and I'm not going to label those dangerous or bad or, uh, but here's my concern about relying on that is one, um, the bilateral alternating stimulation can likely bring up some events or bring up some thoughts about an event. Now, when you're being led by a therapist, we kind of cause it to happen uh, through, through, through uh, reinvigorating that feeling and, and that emotion and reactivating the memory. But let's say that you think of this terrible car wreck that you went to, and then you start watching this bilateral alternating stimulation. Um, what if that start causes some memories that you had forgotten about or some emotion that you had forgotten about? Um, that, that's, a, that's a level of concern for me. Now, I think what you really find, because you don't have somebody there to help you deal with it, uh, and it's not just about looking at this thing going back and forth. There's some there's some cognitive interweaves that we want to give you. There's some places we want to lead you. And certainly there's some places that we want to be able to pull you back from and, and, and get you out of should you it become emotional. The thing that I tell people uh, when, when we're doing EMDR in my office is, listen, this may get emotional. This, this can be difficult. But a couple things I want you to know, and I think this will describe uh, better describe my concern about just relying on something like that. And again, I'm not knocking them. I'm sure they have their uses. But but uh, my concern is, or what I tell people is, this may become emotional, but you need to understand it'll be emotional for about 30 seconds at a time. I'm not going to leave you there. You're going to know you're in my office and not in the middle of that trauma, right? I'm not going to leave you there. And there's techniques we use to help ground you, to keep you from dissociation. Uh, dissociation uh, being flashbacks, nightmares, or actually thinking that you're there. Um, so uh, there's things we're going to use to watch out for that. And I also tell people that it's extremely rare, but should this become overwhelming, we'll stop. You're in charge of this, not me. I'm just kind of facilitating your, helping your brain. You're in charge. So we give instructions like if this gets overwhelming, let go of the things that are vibrating, take the headphones off, 
close your eyes, give me a stop sign with your hand, give me a timeout, do anything other than, of course, uh, say stop, because I don't know if the word stop is part of the memory. So um, that's extremely rare, extremely rare that, that we have to stop. And yes, it can get emotional, but it's extremely rare. It gets overwhelming because we're there to keep that from happening, help keep that from happening. But if that happens when you're watching this little dot go across the screen back and forth or listen to these uh, stimulation on the headphones, <laughs> now what? You know, now, now you're even more consumed by the thing that was consuming you before. So yeah. now here's the thing that I have seen those be helpful for. Uh, and I don't know, you know, I'm sure there's tons of them out there as EMDR grows. One of the things that we'll do with EMDR uh, before we actually start uh, the processing is kind of make sure that you can self-regulate. And one of those one of those ways, not going too far into it, just because it gets a little dry, is uh, we're going to embed some positive memories and some positive emotions and some positive feelings. And the stimulation is going to be very slow and short. Okay. So you're just going to slowly back and forth. It's only going to go a couple different passes. So I have seen, and I have friends that do EMDR, coworkers that do EMDR, that at the end of a rough day, they turn their tappers on low or slow or turn this stimulation on really low and watch it five or six times, I'll take in deep breaths, and it can help kind of calm you down. Think of it as kind of like the deep breaths, uh, you know, when you're, when you're trying to calm yourself or grounding uh, when you're in a situation that you're starting to have a panic attack. So my concern would be um, not in any way a sales pitch, I don't want it to sound like that, but be very careful with trying EMDR without the presence of, of a licensed uh, therapist that's trained in EMDR because it can get really rough. Uh, without somebody there to bring you back. Yeah, absolutely. No, that makes absolute sense. Um, which brings us to, I guess, the last question here would be, is EMDR something that you have to do in person or is it something that you can do virtually? Uh, so you can do it virtually. As a matter of fact, I just took uh, uh, another training in as we're kind of learning this telehealth uh, yes. world. And I've been, I've been doing EMDR by telehealth. It can absolutely be done. But of course, as, you know, as the pandemic came in and we were all trying to scramble and figure out, you know, where, where some of us went to telehealth, some of us stayed in our office, some clients wanted to do telehealth. I'll tell you that I prefer it in person uh, just because I feel like there's a little better connection there and I don't have the same safety concerns. So, um, you know, I can mitigate some of those safety concerns by telehealth. Uh, for example, I need to know where you are, <laughs> where are you sitting, you know, in case we get to something kind of rough and the connection fails or you have an emotional moment or uh, so you can mitigate some of those things. I prefer it in person, but you can absolutely do it virtually. Uh, some of the techniques that are being used now are there are some uh, there are some virtual programs that you can both log on to and the, the therapist can kind of control them, uh, you know, in a full screen uh, laptop or computer control the what you're watching or what you're doing. Uh, I use a video that I can speed up or slow down, um, you know, as, as the eye movement occurs. Uh, there's ways to have, you can get, uh, your client can put a headset on and they can do the, the bilateral alternate stimulation uh, through sound. And you can do uh, self-tapping. And, and literally what that looks like is something that we lead you through, of course, but, uh, you know, um, being able to tap on your legs at a certain rhythm, um, you know, tap on your shoulders in a certain rhythm. Um, you know, I, I prefer in person, but I've had a lot of luck doing it through, through telehealth. Um, there are a couple things that are contraindicated, somebody that's very dissociative, somebody that, that, that say a combat scene comes up and they think they're there. Uh, I once had a friend uh, that had a light bar. They are using a light bar for the bilateral stimulation in person. And uh, somebody that had been in, in very difficult combat and he dissociated and got up and attacked the light bar thinking it was the enemy. So now those things are rare. I don't want to scare anybody about 99.999% of people I work with. They don't dissociate like that other than things like flashbacks, uh, but they know they're in my office. They know they're sitting there. Um, you know, they, they don't think that's where they are, but that was a very extreme case, but there are extreme cases out there and that may be a little contraindicated. Uh, across a computer screen, but I've had great luck with it. And uh, I think we're finding even the people that were, that were stubborn and wanted nothing to do with it and said it were dangerous, we're starting to come around now that it's part of their living. So. Yeah. Amazing. All right. So we have in the Facebook group, we have your link. You're no, you're at Facebook. 
Mm -hmm. Um, you are, I've written down, you are Viking therapist and thin line counseling. So, yeah. So, yeah. So uh, thin line counseling is the name of my private practice here. Uh, that is that you could find that through thinlinecounseling.com or through the Facebook link. Mm -hmm. uh, my other project is called the angry Viking therapist. Um, I was actually kind of given that moniker through academia. Uh, it turns out a guy with a mohawk and a beard and an entire sleeve of Viking tattoos uh, looks like an angry Viking. So, uh, so the, the angry Viking therapist moniker uh, kind of stuck. And uh, that kind of became my outside private practice uh, modality. So I could be reached there, um, you know, through any of those emails that are listed or any of those Facebook groups. Uh, email is probably the easiest uh, just because, you know, that's become a daily life for everybody. Uh, but there are other ways uh, to get a hold of me that I'm sure you'll link to. Okay. So um, before we're parting ways, is there anything that you want to add to this? Anything that you would like to, um, leave us with a parting message of anything? Well, really the big thing I would say is, is for people to know that your trauma does not define you. You know, I knew for a long time that, that my life had changed and likely now that I know what I know about psychology, maybe not just because of one event that may just happen to have been the culminating one. And you don't have to have that one thing. I'll, I have people come in here all the time and say, well, I'm really struggling and I'm depressed or anxious or feeling hopeless or helpless. And, and, and I don't know if it's PTSD and maybe it's not because it doesn't fit the criteria of PTSD, uh, which I'm not inherently concerned about what we diagnose things as. I just want to fix it. I don't really care what we call it. Um, that, that, you know, but, but I feel silly coming in because all I have is that, you know, uh, my dad abandoned us when I was eight. Well, how'd that make you feel? Does helpless, hopeless, not good enough fit? Yeah, that's a trauma then, right? What's a trauma? Something that your brain doesn't know what to deal with. For lack of using a big clinical term, it's what are you supposed to do with that when you're eight? You don't even have a prefrontal cortex thinking brain yet. You're all limbic system. You might as well be a horse. It's all fight or flight, right? Horses don't have a prefrontal cortex. I have to throw that in because I'm in Kentucky, right? So horses, but, um, but uh, you, you, all you have is that limbic system. So did that, perpetuate through your life as helpless, hopeless, not good enough. Yeah. Welcome to trauma. Yeah. yeah. So thank you very, very much. This yeah, has absolutely. been super helpful. There's more comments and stuff going in. I will go in and post your, um, your website um, and information in there as well so that they can reach out to you. Yep. Um, yeah. So thank you. And the more that we can, the more that we can keep getting the word out and helping, the better. So. Sure. And, and I don't mind uh, the people contact me directly. If you go to my website, the, the email address is office at thinlinecounseling.com. Those go to my awesome administrators and they help filter things and, and keep the spam away. But if you replace office with just my first name, Trevor, that's a direct link to me. And I don't, I don't mind people having that. It may take me a little while to respond, but uh, Trevor at thinlinecounseling.com or Dr. Trevor at theangryvikingtherapist.com. Uh, both come to the same place. Okay. I've got the first one written down. So that's the one that I will add into the group Great. Um, for everybody to see. All right. Thank you so much. You bet.